Great. When I first contacted the nunnery to see if I could interview you, they said that you were in retreat and wouldn't be available for a number of weeks or a month before I could, they could connect with you. After so many years doing deep practice, I wanted to, under, to find out why you continue to do retreat and deep practice now. What draws you to it, and what are you trying to cultivate? I mean, when does one stop? I don't think there's a point at which you can say, okay, now I have understood and realized everything. I don't need to practice anymore, and you just stop. I mean, even the most venerable lamas continue to do retreats, isn't it? Absolutely. Do you feel you, you need to continue to sustain the realization to go deeper or for the sheer joy of it, or all three? <laughs> well, actually, I did it because one of my, uh, one Lama who is one of my teachers told me that it was very important to do a retreat at this particular point. So I did. Mm. That's why I did it. Were you mm. trying to cultivate? But of course, you know, I mean, I mean, like with anything, if you're, if you're a musician or if you're a sports person or an artist, you, you have to keep uh, practicing and going, don't you? I mean, you never get a point where you think, okay, now I've done enough, I don't need that anymore, unless you're a Buddha. And even the Buddha went off and sat on a tree to meditate. Right. I know. That's right. Hmm. I mean, he's always said that Lama does retreats. Everybody does retreats. Were you trying to cultivate a particular quality or understanding? Uh, uh, on this particular retreat that I did? Uh, no, I was just doing a, a certain practice uh, that the Lama told me to do, so I was doing it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about having a teacher, since you brought up your, the Lama who was giving you instruction now. You were blessed to have found what they call in Tibetan Buddhism a root guru, that guru that you feel that, that deep soul connection and karmic bond with. And you've also studied with a number of other very uh, high, highly awakened teachers. What's the most precious thing to you about having a teacher? Oh, I, I think, you know, as we're learning any skill, it is an enormous benefit if you have someone who is the expert in that skill to guide you. Otherwise, you are is likely to get into all sorts of um, bad habits unknowingly and, and go off and... and you know, it, how can we assess what we're supposed to be doing and how we're getting along unless there's somebody there who has already walked the path and is able to uh, point out the right direction, isn't it? I mean, obviously, if you're going into unknown territory, you need a guide to change the metal. Otherwise, you know, you never know where this path goes this way, that path goes that way, you meet across roads quickly to go. If you're with somebody who knows the territory, then you can just walk along. You have a number of teachers. Uh, do you feel that any single teacher can be the perfect teacher for everything? Or do you feel that it's important or valuable to study with different teachers? Well, I think it depends. I mean, most lamas themselves have had several teachers. I mean, his own Dalai Lama says he's had 25 in this lifetime, of which two were the most important. But anybody that he learned from, he considered them to be his teacher and, and placed them on his refuge tree. Uh, most people have a primary teacher and then uh, other people who also, you know, enhance the, their practice and as, as they meet with them. I don't think one has to think, oh, 
because so and so is my teacher, therefore I cannot go and listen to other people or get advice from anybody else. That becomes very uh, cliquish, you know, and that's where cults come in. And it makes one quite narrow because, you know, if, if you get different people uh, with different viewpoints, it also opens up uh, one's perspective. One, one recognizes that there are, you know, many approaches. It's challenging to find a true teacher these days. How, what do you advise to people who aren't familiar with the whole... Um, system of having a teacher and the the import and the depth and the subtlety of choosing a teacher well i think it's always been very difficult i don't think this is just a modern phenomenon although of course there are so many people who are out there claiming to be enlightened which i find quite extraordinary as a claim um i think one should be aware of charisma. Uh, many people who are highly charismatic might not actually have other spiritual qualities. Um, and also, I think one should be aware of being attracted to someone just because they have many, many students. Uh, this may be because indeed they are highly qualified and uh, worthy of having many students, or it might just merely be again because a good promotion and a charismatic personality. The Dalai Lama quoting uh, tantric texts says that we should take up to 12 years to uh, study the teacher before totally accepting them. And uh, he suggests that we, as much as possible, we try to see the teacher in an everyday situation, not just when they're in a, a teaching position, you know, like in, in Tibetan Buddhism, where they're sitting up on the throne. What are they like behind the scenes? How do they treat ordinary people who are of no particular obvious benefit to them? You know, I mean, obviously, they're going to be are very careful with big sponsors and uh, important people in the world. So how do they treat the ordinary people? And uh, how do they deal with everyday situations, you know, as far as manifesting, you know, greed or anger, jealousy and so forth is concerned? I mean, one has to, if one is going to put one's, whole spiritual life in their hands, one has to be sure that they are qualified to, to hold that and not just give it away. I mean, <clears throat> you know, many people spend more time, you know, examining a, a good dentist than they do, you know, uh, somebody who is, you know, they're committed to for lifetime after lifetime. Also, one has to have someone one can completely trust that they actually do embody the qualities which they are speaking of and also that, if possible, one truly acknowledges that they understand the student better than the student understands themselves so that they are able to be a genuine guide. This is very difficult to find nowadays. Also, because farmers are very busy, you know, this is the other problem. You know, llamas nowadays, it's not like in the old days when they stayed where they were. Nowadays, they're traveling all around the world. They're opening centers. They're building monasteries. They're going back to Tibet. They're, 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 it's very difficult. You see somebody that you think is fantastic, and then off they go, and you, maybe you never see them again, or you only see them at a distance once a year. Very difficult for people to make a real connection, a heart connection. Do you feel that it you can have teachers from different traditions? Oh, sure. I always had teachers from different traditions. My main practice is Sakya, even though I'm Kagyu. And I mean, I, I have had, uh, you know, I mean, apart from traditions in Tibetan Buddhism, I mean, uh, there 
you know, I have, I have many very good friends who I, I would, in a way, regard also as teachers among Sufis and Christians and Jewish rabbis and uh, Hindu gurus, etc. Why not? They call that interfaith or interspiritual now. And I want to ask you about that, but I think I want to stay on the teachers just a little bit more. Do you feel you can go as deep or as far without a single root guru, without a teacher where you've really established that heart connection with? Can you transcend ego? Can you have non-dual realization? Can you cultivate the kind of discipline and compassion that that's the cornerstones of spiritual life? I mean, it's not impossible if in past lives one really had gone quite far on the path already. But for us ordinary people, it would be really very difficult. It would be like trying to be um, a concert pianist, but never ever having uh, a real, um, you know, instructor to, to help us to, to learn how to play the piano properly. Not just you know, someone teaching the scales, but then a, a real professional who is able to uh, lift one up and beyond the ordinary. That would be very difficult to do all by oneself. And so if that's true just for moving the fingers, how I imagine it trying to actually cultivate the mind and, as you say, go beyond the ego and develop all these inner qualities of compassion and wisdom, by oneself, it would be it would be almost impossible. Not completely impossible. I mean, one certainly could get a certain distance by reading books and downloading from, uh, you know, the internet, and also by going for re retreats and so forth. But it would be difficult to go really, really deeply. Um, without some expert guidance, personal guidance. And because also in the Tibetan tradition, they talk about devotion, you know, so um, as being the, the special way to open up the heart to realizations. And, uh, you know, however much you might like somebody's book, it, it would be very hard to really have heartfelt devotion towards somebody you don't really know. In your experience, what has that that experience of devotion opened up for you that, that you would say would be different or hard to cultivate otherwise? Is it a feeling of empathy or compassion or possibility? Oh, well, devotion is a total openness. It's an openness. It's an openness to, uh, to the blessings. That's what devotion does. It lifts up the heart and softens it, and then it opens it so that the blessings can enter. Otherwise, if we don't really have devotion, then our heart is closed. So even though it's like, even though the sun is shining and shining, if we draw the curtains, uh, the room is dark. Can you explain what you mean by blessings? It's a, a feeling of recognizing the nature of the mind, you know, of, of genuinely feeling that the Lama's mind and one's own mind not only are, are the same, that, you know, the ultimate guru is one's own mind, but not the ordinary thinking conceptual mind, but this very deep level of pure awareness, which is the nature of our wisdom, compassion, mind, our Buddha nature. So to, to access that, it's very difficult on our own and, and we need someone to, to activate it for us so that um, we, we can recognize it within ourselves. Are you serving as a, as a teacher to those in your nunnery and to others in the West? Do you serve as that type of teacher you're speaking about? Oh, no, not at all. I mean, I'm not a lama. I'm not a guru. Um, here at the nunnery, mostly I'm just um, the administrator. I mean, they have teachers and they have their own lama. 
And uh, when I go around giving talks, I'm just basically um, getting people... Well, mostly I talk about things which they can do to bring Dharma into their everyday life, but not in the sense of uh, personal one-on-one direction. Just getting them interested so then they can find themselves a teacher. I know many people have been inspired by your story and your devotion, and they've been inspired partly because you had unusual passion for the spiritual life and also because you were very courageous as a woman to go to places and to take the time and to face challenges that that not that many uh, Western women embraced at the time that you did. I think a lot of women see you as a role model and in some ways as a teacher. Do you accept that? I have to accept it insofar as um, any, you know, the role models for women are very rare, as we all know. So this, um, uh, what can I say, uh, the, this picture which Vicky McKenzie painted, uh, if it has inspired people, then that's wonderful. I mean, I myself, looking at myself, can see that really that was just a very romanticized idea of who I really am. And actually, I'm really a totally ordinary sort of person, as I'm sure anybody who knows me quickly finds out. But if the the ideal um, is exemplified in in the way that she presented my life, then, then that's a good thing. I can't do anything about that. When I read the book, my first feeling was, oh, this sounds like an interesting person. I'd like to meet her. Do you feel like to some degree we always do that with our teachers, that we turn them into ideals and that's part of their role? Or do you feel that, or do you feel that some of the teachers I, have different attainment? Uh, have different what? Have a higher attainment. Oh, yes. I mean, some, I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, some, some teachers are, are really exemplary i mean they are the when one meets them one just feels that here one is in the presence of our complete human potential way beyond anything that most of us could even hope for in this lifetime of course i mean naturally i mean so that's why um you know we, we are inspired and blessed by by the presence of genuine teachers and that's why I don't claim to be a teacher in that sense. I mean, at least I don't want to fool anybody. What would you ad- advise to people who call themselves spiritually independent, those who were born either outside of a specific religious tradition or those who've grown beyond the customs and mores of the traditions that they grew up in? How can they best find a path or practice or teacher to learn from? Could you repeat the last part? How can somebody who's not identified with a tradition or doesn't have a particular karmic connection with any tradition, how can they best figure out who, how to, where to look for a teacher, how to find a path, how to begin their practice? They have a, a spiritual yearning, but they don't know where to go. Yeah, well, that's very difficult. I mean, I meet a lot of people who are in that position. I mean, their their quest is totally sincere, but they haven't really made a, a, a heart connection with any particular person or any particular path. I think that, you know, basically we have to think, like building a, a temple, you know, everybody sees our temple and they're, they're very fascinated by all the murals and all the decoration. But that temple rests on very deep foundations. And those foundations don't look particularly fancy, but they're, they're essential for the building to last. So all spiritual traditions, genuine spiritual traditions, 
share more or less the same foundations of having a mind which is is peaceful, which is uh, one pointed, with, with a heart which is is kind and thinking towards the happiness of others, not just absorbed in one's own um, pleasure, and so forth. So. I think it's very important for whoever uh, that we tame the mind first. We tame the mind and we open the heart. And then whatever spiritual path or non-spiritual path we're on, we uh, will not fail in that. You know, we are, we are on a path. And that doesn't belong to any particular credo. I mean, that that for anybody you know we have very wild minds full of greed and anger and jealousy and 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 egotism and so to deal with that in in a, a sane manner and to open up the heart to love and compassion i mean you can't go wrong with that Eastern traditions, yoga and Buddhism and meditation have, have recently in the last 15, 20 years become really popular in the West. There, You can go to almost any yoga studio, cafe, uh, YMCA and find some type of practice or reference to practice. Overall, do you think that this popularization is having a good effect on the Western mind, or do you think it's trivializing the the depth that it's that that the those practices are pointing to? Well, it's very difficult to know at this point. You know, we have to wait, I think, for another twenty years and see what's happened. I mean, it could be that people who go for meditation courses to relieve their stress levels and high cholesterol might, since they have no particular uh, agenda apart from that, be very surprised by the results they get. And uh, that might uh, inadvertently turn them to more uh, profound spiritual quest. You can't know. Uh, of course, on one level, it cheapens the whole thing. But on the other level, it might be... Uh, a skillful way of beginning to let people understand also that meditation isn't something just es esoteric or something which only monks and hermits do. That it's actually um, a very helpful and useful way of dealing with the mind. You know, it, it makes the mind more healthy. And, and this can only be a good thing, can't it? It seems to be introducing a sense of values and aspiration in in a culture that didn't that had lost connection with that. Exactly, and if this is the way to go through it, by talking about stress relief rather than enlightenment, then okay, so be it. I mean, the basics are all the same. You calm your mind. You become. You know, this whole psychological interest nowadays in mindfulness. Who knows where that can lead? I mean, we don't have to talk about, you know, I mean, in a way it's good because nobody are thinking about um, getting any particular big spiritual gains. They're just uh, very on a very mundane level. And, and maybe that's much better. It doesn't uh, inflate the ego so much. One of the things in the West that I think, and, and it's probably increasingly so in India, but people long for spiritual community. There are few monasteries or nunneries where people can go or churches that have vibrant communities that people feel that they, they've met their Dharma brothers and sisters and, and practice. Have you, in your travels to the West, have you seen examples or have you thought of ways that people can cultivate meaningful spiritual relationships outside of a monastic environment? Well, I think nowadays um, most of the uh, Dharma communities and ashrams and so forth are 
are targeted for lay people rather than for monastics. I mean, monastic settlements are very few, both in, nowadays in Christianity and in, in Buddhism. Whereas uh, communities of, of sincere lay people uh, seem to be growing, even if people don't stay there the whole time, at least they can go there for, um, you know, periods. So this seems to be the way it's going. And it's good because, as the Buddha said, you know, good companionship is essential for the spiritual path. And otherwise, people with spiritual interests feel very isolated and lonely because they have no one with whom to share their values. Spiritual life is both about individual transformation and also about cultural change. The Buddha was a cultural revolutionary. He changed the values, he changed the laws, he changed the order of priorities in life. He really posited a different potential and a different direction and goal for people to aspire to. We certainly need a lot of cultural change on all kinds of levels for our own happiness, for the quality of our relationships, everything from the environment to the way we treat the poor and the disadvantaged around the world. What If you were to think about the most important things to cultivate on the spiritual path for cultural change, what would those be? I think we have to go back to the three roots of um, negative action, which are, you know, our, our greed and our aggression and our basic egoistic ignorance because that fuels so much in society, doesn't it? I mean, where, where the society is telling you that the more you get, the more happy and fulfilled you will be. And entertainment is um, full of, uh, you know, either movies or video games of blowing people up as a solution to your problems. And the promotion of, of one's uh, egoistic um, desires as being perfectly legitimate, uh, those, in other words, the very emotions which the Buddha said lead to suffering are being touted as the, the path to happiness. So no wonder everyone's messed up. And until we, we appreciate that we're, we're walking in the wrong direction and actually to cultivate contentment and appreciation and generosity rather than greed and, um, you know, patience and compassion and loving kindness instead of anger and to put the happiness of others before one's own happiness uh, is the way to actually feel a, a deep sense of in a contentment and, and satisfaction and joy, you know, until then, look where we're going. I mean, it's a big problem for the whole world, even for India, because now the values of India are also being transformed by this huge onslaught of media coverage about, um, you know, endless consumer desires. What to do? Do you feel that we have the same challenges or different challenges than the Buddha's time? I mean, obviously the world has evolved and changed, not just technologically, but in, in many different ways than the world of Guru Rinpoche or Jetsongkhapa. Do you feel that our ego challenges are different? Are they more complex now? Or can you, are, are they, were they equally complex and challenging several thousand years ago? You know, I think it's, it's, the Buddha said that our minds are like mad monkeys, and I don't think uh, things have changed much <laughs> since those days, you know. Um, so, in general, the, the one thing which, which makes me wonder about rebirth is that you'd think after all this time of being endlessly recycled, we would have learned something. But actually, our, our basic reactions seem to be just as ignorant as they were thousands of years ago. 
I mean, we don't really seem to have uh, solved the, the problems of how to share this planet together equitably. Isn't it strange? It certainly is. So I think that a lot of the solutions which they came up with uh, centuries ago are still more or less valid. One of the things which I find interesting is that although Westerners often put or appear to be so much more confident and self-promoting, they often suffer from much more severe lack of self-esteem, low self-esteem, in fact, uh, than most traditional societies. They don't like themselves. Why do you think that is? I don't know, really. It, it's an interesting phenomena because on the one hand, they seem so much more confident and so much more in command of, of their, you know, their whole way of living. And yet at the same time, when you peel off that surface layer, you have all this enormous amount of doubts and, and uh, as I say, very, very low sense of confidence and self-esteem. And, and basically, the major, at least the majority of people I seem to meet from the West don't really like themselves very much. And uh, so they, they also use the spiritual path sometimes to um, beat themselves up in, instead of using it to um, balance and heal their sense of self. Do you think that's because uh, the Western culture is more divorced from essential spiritual tradition and essential teaching, so there's no structure? Or do you feel it's the result of something else? Well, I think it is partly um, a, a, the lack of real meaning in life. I mean, if you, all your meaning in life is, is based on acquisition and trying to stay young forever and just very close family values and the family itself is breaking up, um, then people have a, a lack of real purpose. In addition, I think they, they often feel themselves to be um, essentially tainted, Maybe, whether this is because of Abrahamic religions with the idea that we are all essentially sinful, I don't know. Um, but in, in Asia, where the idea is that essentially we all have Buddha nature, I mean, essentially we're all absolutely fine, we just got a little messed up along the way, but, you know, that, that isn't our inherent nature then people have much more a sense of inner confidence. I mean, they, they, they are much more at home with themselves and, and not always, as I say, beating themselves up inwardly. People are very harsh about themselves, Westerners especially. They give themselves very, very unkind messages, which they wouldn't do uh, towards uh, some, you know, a friend. They wouldn't have any friends if they did. How do you help people with that? How do you help people find deeper meaning? Well, we talk about it. We try to recognize that's what they're doing. And then I encourage them to do, um, you know, like meta meditations and so forth. And, and start being kind to themselves and hearing what they say to themselves and asking themselves if they would say it like that to somebody else because it's very important. I mean, of course, ultimately we have to overcome the ego, but it's very important first that we have um, a very balanced and healthy ego to overcome. Because as long as our sense of self is, is injured, uh, one will not be able to really um, access to deep levels of consciousness. And one will just be miserable and judgmental of oneself and then judgmental of others. It's almost like uh, there's a new preliminary practice that you have to do prior to the preliminary practices. You know, what I just 
encourage people to do shamatha meditation, you know, it's calm abiding because it helps to make the mind more quiet and more attentive. And one cannot actually get into deeper states of consciousness until all the psychic factors are in balance. That gives a great sense of peace and inner joy, which can be very healing. As you as you're going into the the later decades of your life, and I hope you you have many more. And what do you feel you want to cultivate for yourself in these the at this period of your life? Oh, nowadays I'm I'm very uh, I'm getting more and more involved in various um, other issues apart from running nunneries. Um, Especially now, when I'm involved in a, um, we're, we're concerned with the the problems facing um, non Himalayan nuns in the Tibetan tradition. That means Westerners and other Asians who uh, become nuns in the Tibetan tradition because they are so completely overlooked and um, really very unsupported, both by lamas and by the laity. You know, they're, they're uh, 50 years down the line from when I first got ordained, and really the situation hasn't improved very much. And so we're trying to think what to do now to help um, the, the so many women who, who do get ordained and then find themselves with no no support system. I mean, either psychological or financial. I mean, Tibetans assume that every every Westerner is a, a secret millionaire, and um, there's no there, there's no appreciation of the problems which are facing um, you know modern day sangha outside of the monasteries. So that's what I'm involved in at the moment. That's one. That's very important work. Do you feel that support for or people those who've ordained has has lessened over the last years? Because I, for a while, it was very it was more popular, and that in current decades, uh, people are moving around much more quickly, and and um, the idea of ordaining or of supporting others, other Westerners who've ordained has, has dropped, or do you feel it's increasing slightly? Well, I don't think the idea of, uh, supporting Western uh, monastics was ever very big on anybody's agenda. Um, I mean, for, for example, the Lamas, when they come to the West, uh, mostly, uh, are fundraising for their own monasteries back in India or Nepal or Tibet. And they I've never heard the Lama um, encourage uh, lay supporters to support their own Sangha. They're always supporting the Lama Sangha. You know, but the the actual it's the first time really I think in Buddhist history where the native Sangha is not supported by the, their own lay supporters. So in the Tibetan tradition, this is especially so because Tibetans are endlessly um, seeing themselves as refugees and, and in need of uh, financial support from others. So it's a big problem, actually, because there are thousands of, of monastics, but none of them, almost hardly anybody, you want to go into retreat, you want to do studies, but who is going to help you? That's right. It's not something that people think about, but... No, they don't. That's the problem. So we're hoping that once we, we point it out, um, and they will start thinking about it, you know? Because a lot of these uh, women who become nuns give up a lot. You know, they give up their families, they give up their profession, they give up their homes, they sell their houses, and they come out in lots of faith, assuming that, you know, they will now be taken care of if they devote themselves. But in fact, it it's, isn't so. There, there's really not a network 
uh, of support for for foreign monastics. That's right. Mm. So we decided we should do something about it. <laughs> we need a contemporary King Ashoka. Oh, oh, well, we need we need a few llamas to get out there and say, look, you know, great, thank you for supporting us for the last fifty years. Now start supporting your own. That would be that would certainly help uh, integrate the idea of deep practice. And the need to dedicate ourselves to the to 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 challenging transformation into our culture in a way that it's yeah. not that would be that would be a, have some interesting effects not just on those monastics being supported but on the culture itself. Well, I think in any culture, one needs at least a nucleus of people whose. Uh, basic values are turned towards um, the cultivating the, the inner life and contentment with little, uh, keeping discipline, and even just the fact that you can be celibate and happy um, is something of a, a revelation nowadays. And I think that example of, of Dharma life well lived is important for everybody and um that people appreciate it once they see it they do it gives faith well it gives you a reminder of what life is really all about after all he was a prince but when he left the palace after his enlightenment he didn't go back no he didn't and he could have. That's right. If you if you were to give one piece of advice to somebody reading this interview who had never done spiritual practice before, what would you encourage them to think about? I think the important thing in this age is to really try to use one's everyday life with one's family, one's work colleagues, one's friends, everything, to study how to use that very daily life as your spiritual practice. Because if we just think, well, if I meditate for an hour or two a day, and the rest of the day is just ordinary worldly activity, then the mind is never going to change. And so we need to use everything, all our relationships and everything which we do as our spiritual path. Then there is hope for transformation. That's great. My last question is for, for individuals who have done, started their practice 25, 30 years ago and who've been to some degree, dedicated spiritual practitioners now for, for quite a long time, but don't necessarily have a, a level of confidence in themselves or in their commitment, even though they've been had the discipline. What would you say to them? Well, it's hard, you know. It's, it's a long path. There's no doubt. Um, maybe they should intensify their practices if they can from time to time, you know, to do like a month retreat or, or so forth when they completely submerge themselves in the practice. Maybe that would help. And what's your, this is, last, this is really the last question, what's your hope for the world? Well, it would be nice to think that finally the world wakes up and recognizes it's totally going in the wrong direction and uh, that we, we have to make a lot of changes. The changes are inner and from the inner comes the outer. I, I hope we have enough time. Time because of the biosphere issues? Time because, you know, what we are doing to this planet from an ecological point of view, you know, we don't have that much time left. May we all use that time. 
Yeah, I mean, if we go to keep going the way we're going, then we're, we're going to go right over the edge. So hopefully people will have the intelligence, you know, as human beings, we're supposed to be intelligent. We'll arouse the intelligence and the dedication to really reverse the way we're going at the moment and to cultivate genuine values of life instead of the false values which we're being fed nowadays. Well, thank you so much for your time and also for your commitment. Well, thank you, Amy, for your time and commitment. It's great what you're doing. Thank you so much. All the best. And to you, my dear. May you be well and happy.